name first? Yes. My name is Arvind Ramadas. Yes, Arvind. I'm a college student. And the story that you just shared is very related. I'm a freshman now. And my, I have two questions. One, I want to know the will of God. And I know some of it, not much of it. Because I read my Bible in my home. And I want to know about baptism. Okay. Um, finding the will of God in our lives. This was the first part of the question. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a continuing uh, process. Um, First of all, you may have a sense of where you, where you want to be when you're 80 years old. Um, and that's lovely, and God may have planted that in your heart. But the question is, you know, what's up for, for this year, or these, even these next uh, few months, to do well um, on your uh, schoolwork, do well as you relate to a profession, or some kind of ministry that you feel God is uh, calling you to. Um, I'll never forget I was asked, uh, for example, I was asked to talk about finding the will of God for your life at a, a college, and we had more than 2,000 uh, students required to be in chapel. So I said, uh, actually I'm an expert on, on uh, this subject because I changed my major five times in college. <laughs> and the guy that had just introduced me gasped, uh, but I made something good out of it. I said, look. Following the will of God is a daily activity, and God never wastes anything, all right? So even if you feel God is calling you to work on a particular subject as a major, and don't be totally shocked if he gives you the direction to change your major next year. But what you learn in this major will still help you. There's no garbage, there's no waste in the way that God guides us. Uh, so in college, for example, I started as an engineering major, uh, switched to math, then to philosophy, then to physics, and back to math. But I learned a lot on each step of the way. Uh, so I think too often we get burdened by finding God's will for our lives and, and hoping to get the whole plan you know, laid out on an email from God, uh, you know, what, what the plan is for the next 80 years. But uh, God usually doesn't do it that way. Uh, maybe one other uh, thought. Uh, the issue is really our obedience to God. Some, I've read books that say, finding the will of God for your life is silly. Just do what the, God, what the Bible says. You know, uh, what does the Lord require? Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. That's it. Don't think you're special, that you have a special calling. Now, that's half right. We ought to be doing those things, right? Do justice. Not just be merciful, but love being merciful. Not grudgingly merciful, but loving mercy. Uh, walking humbly with your God. That's all Micah 6, 8. At the same time, God made you as an individual with a particular calling. And I think as you grow in the Lord, as you're obedient to these general principles, God will will plant ideas and uh, give you a, uh, a clear idea of your own walk and relationships and uh, you know, moving forward maybe to uh, get married and have a family. Uh, there's, there's one person I believe that if that's the plan, uh, God has in mind for you. But uh, you may have to uh, have a lot of friendships along the way to find uh, that. And that's exciting and Joyful in its own way, right? Um, but uh, uh, it's a it's a, a process of learning to walk with God daily and to uh, grow in the Lord. And uh, again, God doesn't waste anything. I hope that's helpful. Good. Can you speak about baptism? Yeah, um, water baptism. There's baptism of the Spirit, and there's water baptism. As I look back, I was asking the Lord once, a couple years after the experience I shared, asking the Lord uh, uh, to show me what the baptism of the Spirit is, because some people make it merely uh, speaking in tongues or, or whatever. So anyway, I was pleading with the Lord, didn't get an answer. 
lay down, went to sleep. The next morning, as I'm getting up, and there's no one else in the room, the door is closed, but I hear this voice as clear as my voice to you now. <laughs> the voice, I'm sure, of the Lord saying, what I did for you in the library a couple years ago, that was baptism of the Spirit. And it was really opened up my pores to the Spirit more going forward as well, not just in that moment. Um, water baptism, I am honestly don't know the policies of Emmanuel Church. But I do believe water baptism is important as the scripture teaches it. So other uh, leaders, uh, she explained it to me. Okay, good. And, and I'd like to know, uh, but water baptism is important. It's a testimony of God's work in our lives. Good. Oh, sure. Yeah, there, baptism is loaded in the New Testament. You see uh, three different meanings merged together in one practice. With John the Baptist, it's baptism of the remission of sin. So, you know, water doesn't wash sin away, but by being baptized, by being immersed in water, it's a, it's a way of saying we want God to wash us completely. Where this is a like taking your daily bath, only this is a spiritual bath symbolized by water. So seeking God's forgiveness for our sins, that's part of uh, baptism. Uh, baptism also is a reenactment of Jesus' uh, burial and resurrection. So we're buried in water. This is Romans chapter uh, 6. Uh, it says that we are buried in water as, as Jesus uh, was buried. And then we come back to life. It's a new life. It's a testimony of I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not, but it's not really me. It's Christ living through me. All right. It's a very powerful uh, testimony of our own death and resurrection through the power of Jesus' death and resurrection. And then third, so it's cleansing. It's a testimony of our death and resurrection in Jesus' death and resurrection. And then third, this immersion into the Spirit. Water is frequently a symbol of the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture. Um, and, and so to be immersed in water is, is a way of saying, I want to be immersed in the presence of the Spirit. And of course we're brought back up because we still have to breathe. But there's a reminder, we want that total uh, surround experience of the Spirit in our lives. Isn't that awesome? Cleansing, testimony of our death and resurrection, and the presence of the Spirit covering everything. All right, I hope that's helpful. Usually, by the way, usually I hear when people explain, it's just one of those. But I think the power of the scripture is that one symbol is loaded, at least with those three powerful meanings. Great question, good. Someone else? Yes, Christian. Oh, yes, um, my question is concerning science. Uh, I'm just wondering why science and Christianity like segregating each side like kind of don't mess with each other. Like scientists try to stay away from like religion and religious people tend to like you know like you know kind of separate themselves from science. I'm just wondering right. why why is it this like divide and the segregation when one predates the other like you know. First came religion and then through the sure. the Mexico came science. So I'm just wondering why is this like Sure. Like why each side is getting each other in a way. Right. Right. Good good uh, question. Great question. Um, science and religion. There's a lot to be said, but let me do two things. Unfortunately, in the schools these days, high school, college, whatever, what's taught as science is not uh, hardly ever the history of science. Instead, the discoveries and how that affects technology and so forth. All very good. But the history of science deals more with how things were discovered, how things, how people had to struggle through uh, complex questions of relationships between different force fields and chemical bondings and so forth. And how do they come up with all this? What's the story? And, and that's much more spiritual. 
because very often uh, people refused to accept old theories because they were complex and they knew God was a God of simplicity and order. We got messy systems like the Ptolemaic astronomy. Uh, people were just crying out, this is not, this is, can't be true. Uh, give us something that has more order. And thus Copernicus and then Kepler. Copernicus thought it was all circles. Kepler helped explain what an ellipse was and how, in fact, uh, planetary motion and uh, motion within the galaxy and so forth is elliptical. Uh, but it was based on a deep, profound, godly awareness that the God does things in, with order and, and structure. Um, and we have that same uh, goal, and also uh, compassion. We've got to fix this. Uh, the drive for us, many scientists, as, as we are here this morning, is to find um, a vaccine for this uh, particular Corona-19 uh, virus. Um, and what drives that? What gives these uh, physicians and scientists this passion to help people? Well, the roots of that are, are the God of the Bible, uh, because He is compassionate. He shows His love, and, and the whole model of uh, compassion and help for others is uh, stated most clearly in the Scriptures. So, instead of separate silos, in fact, these are interconnected in a lot of different ways. Discovery process, and also the, um, the history and discovery process, but also the passion. One other thing, and I'd be glad to email to anyone this, an article I wrote years ago, but arguing that within the doing of science, some questions are not allowed. For example, if, if you took uh, chemistry in high school, uh, you might have put electrodes in water, uh, charged electrodes, and then you get oxygen forming at one electrode and hydrogen at the other. Now, if the, if the lab report had the question, what made oxygen form at one electrode and hydrogen at the other, you might have been tempted to write, God made it that way. But you would, even if the teacher was a Christian, that would not count. You would do a big red X, because that's not a chemistry answer. So it's true, God made it that way, but it doesn't answer from the narrow framework of chemistry. So when we do chemistry, it's, it's what we call methodological naturalism. We exclude the spiritual questions while doing chemistry. But once the chemistry is done, we can give praise to God. We can use the discovery to serve God in some way. Um, but the doing of science, you still have to have a natural explanation even if you know that the deeper explanation is supernatural. Can you imagine if, if the answer for every chemistry question was God made it that way, we would get nowhere, all right? Uh, so, uh, the obvious, and we laugh about it, but then the point is, if you're tying one hand behind the back, you're not bringing up God questions, you're doing just natural answers, natural questions, Fine, but that doesn't mean the rest of your life you have to have that uh, hand tied behind the back. Take your lab coat off, and you know, go out of the lab, get involved with the other issues of life, walk with God. There's no reason that the scientific limitations have to carry over to any other part of life. Problem is, we've allowed some atheist scientists to dictate to us that since their theory doesn't bring up God, of course, because it's a scientific theory, <coughs> then that means you can do your life completely without God too, which is just irrational. What they say about the lab is one thing, but what they say about life is something else. Uh, your one, one model is if you uh, uh, are in your lab and coming up with natural explanations for everything, and then you're done, you put the lab, uh, apron away and, and you're out the door and you see children playing across the street. Can you explain their behavior as mere chemistry and physics? No way, right? 
So it's a good wake-up call, but, but some of these very narrow atheist scientists want to say, yeah, yeah, that's all there is, is uh, chemistry and physics. And uh, even for their own kids, they seem then disconnected with creativity, with you know, vision, with joy, all these things that are way beyond the explanations, totally uh, explanations of physics and chemistry. So yeah, I think we have suffered from uh, belief that just because scientists can achieve a lot by having a narrow focus on the natural world, that somehow that's the whole world, and that's just idiotic to, to give a very good scientific label to idiotic. So be free to accept the blessings of science and at the same time uh, give God glory. One, to me, one of those powerful models ancient model by today's standards, uh, Newton transformed physics and astronomy. An amazing, brilliant man, Newton, Isaac Newton, was also a devout evangelical Christian. He wrote more Bible study pages than physics, but we know him as a great physicist. But he believed in God, he was always encouraging people to study the Bible, but in his main work in physics, which he called uh, mathematical principles, because he was looking for mathematical principles within the physical universe, okay? God is the ultimate mathematician. It doesn't bring up God at all. 900 pages. He's analyzing data, coming to conclusions, uh, defending different formulas that have stood the test of time ever since as, as good general formulas. And all of it with no mention of God at all. Because he's doing physics. He defined physics. But then he added a five page appendix to the book. And in five pages, he mentions God 36 times. And it reads like a psalm from the Bible. Because he said, you look, with this amazing structure of the physical universe, we have to give glory to the one who is the source of it all. But a lot of times that same book is published with, without Newton's appendix. So people don't realize that he added on the bigger picture even in that first publication. So now you know the history. Again, history matters. Uh, science doesn't happen in a vacuum. Hope that's helpful. Let's do uh, one other question. Another question? Anybody? Well, great questions. Both of these, wonderful. And uh, so glad to be able to uh, give some light. Oh, yes. Orlando, by the way, let me introduce Orlando, longtime friend of mine for a couple of years here. And I discovered he lived in the neighborhood. So I said, You got to come to church. So I uh, encourage him to uh, keep coming. Orlando uh, Martinez. My, my question for you, and, um, yeah, and we're in the season of Lent. Right? And, and what's your approach to the season of land right. as far as um, um, sacrifice and suffering for the Lord? Or, uh, what, 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 what are your thoughts, just in general? Sure. Yeah, and, and I think yeah, starting with uh, Ash Wednesday and, and moving forward, and uh, Sundays are not part of the 40 days of Lent. So on Sundays, you know, you're, we're kind of free to celebrate whatever. But I do think it's a, a very special time. I encourage people to, I have a website, Green Lent, with uh, a, a Bible study for every day of Lent, and a Lenten action, a way to take good care of God's world, that, that you can do a different Lenten action for every uh, day of Lent. Um, I do think it's so important because uh, Passion Week and Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday are so huge in their meaning. We need to prepare our hearts, our minds, our guts to really be able to celebrate uh, authentically, fully. And whether you call it Lent or call it Preparation for Passion Week or whatever, 
it, I encourage it 100. percent So uh, and and it's you know so make it a spiritual preparation. And of course, if we do that, then of course what we've learned in the process: more time reading the Bible, more time praying. Uh, maybe we'll get. Uh, Lent is long enough to uh, get into a good habit that'll continue uh, the rest of uh, 2020. So, greenlent.com. What it does, because I, I uh, work on an agreement with the uh, World Evangelical Alliance, which we all love and this church is part of, um, I worked on an agreement that they would have this Green Lent document on, on their website. And you go to mygreenlent.com gets you right to that. And they keep track. I think there are uh, uh, more than a couple thousand that have used this uh, document and you're welcome to download it or read it online. All right. Well, uh, uh, we have some good food in the lobby then. And don't hesitate to uh, uh, ask for me the uh, keys for kids. And the summary of the three Three principles uh, from the scripture. I made lots of copies too, so I'll put them on the food table uh, for you. Take uh, more than one if you'd like. But I, I hope you find that empowering. It just it opened my eyes to the multiple ways the Spirit is present when I tended to just go with uh, one or the other of the, the uh, uh, ways that we were describing this morning. So I hope you feel the same empowerment and uh, liberation. Let's pray uh, once more together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the God of wisdom. You're the God of answers. And help us to grow more and more in knowledge of you and knowledge of, of your power and your ways for our lives. May we truly walk uh, in your presence, doing justice and uh, loving mercy. And in every other way, seeking your will for each of our lives. Thank you for your grace and your wisdom, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.